Coming to you from Orange County, California, this is the Jug Life Podcast with Max Ada and Chad Wesley Smith. Hey everybody, Chad Wesley Smith here, bringing you another episode of the Jug Life Podcast. Joined as always, Montana Miracle Man, Max Ada. How you doing, buddy? Doing pretty well. How are you doing, Chad? Pretty good. Hopefully I'm saying the same in an hour. (laughs) (laughs) So today uh, we're going to be probably talking about one of our most serious topics, our most sensitive subjects, uh, certainly we've ever addressed on this show, and that that is the concept of... uh, of transgender athletes, of gender testing in sport, and it's becoming a more, you know, more prevalent issue, something more at the forefront of, of athletics every day, and something that you know, we wanted to address because it had a pretty direct uh, effect on uh, Max's wife, Joanne Ada, at the recent uh, World Games uh, for weightlifting. So could you talk about yeah, the situation so there? Yeah, so there was... In the Masters World Games, we had I, one competitor I know of, uh, Laurel Hubbard, was was is transgendered uh, and competed in the super heavyweight category in the female division. Um, you know, and, and won. Um, I think made like a personal record snatch, 131 kilos, and then maybe clean and jerk to like 149, I think. Um, and you know, obviously, one grandmaster um, beat beat the field by a huge margin. And Joanne um, was the runner-up for jo- grandmaster. Yeah, Joanne was second place overall so, to that. Grandmaster is a comparison by Malone Sinclair, Malone yeah. Metzer. Yeah. So an age-adjusted Sinclair formula. Uh, so Joanne would have been the best female lifter of the entire competition had it not been for Laurel Hubbard. Yeah. There's also, I mean, that's not the first, there's obviously been a lot of stuff, not a lot, but there's been cases of, of this happening, not this happened, this particular thing happening, but of transgendered competitors in other sports too. You've got uh, a few years ago, there was uh, Castor Semenya. Uh, well, before we get into that, I think, let's let's make a disclaimer here. We're probably going right, to have to make many right, disclaimers right. Throughout, <laughs> throughout this episode that you know, Max and I are not experts in this. We're not professing to be experts in this. We're going to share the limited amount of research we've done on, on the rules and, and effects of, of gene therapy and all this stuff, and then things that are, are our opinions. You know, we're not setting out to offend people in this. More likely than not, we'll probably say something wrong. You know, we're, we're going to call something wrong name, wrong term, we don't know everything that's the, the right stuff to say, so please understand that when we're going <laughs> Bear with this. us here for a second. So the, the first important distinction, I think, to, to make as we get into this is that Laurel Hubbard was born and lived as a man for the right. overwhelming majority of her life. Other athletes we're going to talk about, and probably even a bit more of what we're going to talk about, are female athletes who, on their birth certificate, it says female. They've lived their entire lives as women, and then at some point during their athletic career, when they were, more likely than not, very, very good, the competitors and people around the sport said, what's going on here? This is not a woman. Right. Uh, and, and then applying some level of, of gender testing. So that's, that's going to be a very important distinction to, to make between Laurel Hubbard, born as a man, competing as a woman, and Castor Semenya, who we'll talk about more, uh, Maria Martinez Patino, who we'll talk about more, born as women, and then gender testing issues right. on and, in their career. And I think, yeah, the, the major thing is that all of the stuff that comes out, the, the stories and whatnot, I think maybe clump everybody together into this into the same categories like oh there's there's this sort of gender identity stuff that's this whole category there's a lot of different things like chad was saying there's a lot of different things actually going on with very specific uh 
circumstances around each individual athlete's scenario. Um, you know, and so obviously, like, like you just said, Laura Hubbard is, is, was transitioning or transitioned from male to female. Um, and then you have other situations that are maybe very different where, where an athlete is maybe even unaware of, you know, uh, pre-existing uh, situations that, that are not as obvious or not as conscious, right? Yeah. So let's, let's establish kind of the, the rules. Uh, again, this is from a limited amount of research, so there may be updates to these rules since, you know, from where I read about them last night. But to my, to our understanding, uh, for an NC, the NCA rule is that a a transgender athlete, and, and just for the ease of, of this, we're probably going to use that as a bit of a blanket term, understanding that it's going to encompass a lot of nuance within that, has to sit out from competition for one year while undergoing hormone therapy, and then the IOC rule. Uh, so uh, to compete as an Olympic athlete or in sports that are governed by you know, Olympic sanctioned bodies like the World Master Games for weightlifting was that there must be two years of hormone therapy uh, post-operation for like a post-gender reassignment surgery. Um, again. The terms. I might be saying the wrong word. I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna stop apologizing it for the rest of the time. <laughs> Blanket apology for all the, all the times that I mess up some of the t the terms here. Um, and with within that IOC rule, there at least was an establishment of a limit of testosterone of 10 nanomoles of per liter of testosterone. Um, one of the cases that we're gonna talk about a little bit more involving an Indian sprinter named Duti Chand. Uh, looks like it's suspended for the ruling in that by the, the, the court of arbitration and sport suspended that limit. That, so in these situations, there is not a limit to how much testosterone female competitors could have. Now, where this gets a, a little bit cloudier too and, and where I don't have a complete understanding of it, is how things are differentiated between uh, no limit on testosterone and drug testing. Yeah, that's it. That's really that's really interesting to me because it's it's a. Uh, I mean, obviously, there, there's there's motives for everything. I mean, you have to you have to assume that every very competitive athlete has at some point had a motive. To, I mean, the motive to cheat is obvious, right? Uh, to win, so. When you're in a situation where your your personal life outside of sport involves whatever it involves in terms of uh, you know what you believe should 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 or shouldn't be uh, you know in your life in terms of gender, et cetera, et cetera, how that you know I, I don't I don't it would be very unlikely I think am I to the stretch that somebody would reassign their gender or change gender to gain an edge in performance because, you know, I, I suppose the recognition you gain from winning would also be, you know, quote unquote, tainted by yeah, the, he, the incredible amount of stress that you have to go through in life. Just going through that process has got to be not an easy thing, you know, whereas if you're just somebody who, you know, cheats and takes drugs to win, that that is what it is. And that's not, a, you know, very um, much a win at all costs scenario. Yeah, that would, anything, be, that would be extreme. Anything that it takes. Um, so a little bit more about the IOC rule there. Uh, to my understanding from, from what I've read, in 2015 through this case of Duty Chand versus the uh, Athletics Federation of India and the, the ruling through the Court of Arbitration for Sport, the 10 nanomoles per liter of testosterone limit for women currently does not exist. That was a case in 2015, and uh, they told the IAAF, the International Athletics Federation, the governing body for, world governing body for track and field, that they had two years to prove that putting a limit on it is important, that essentially that testosterone is significant to female athletic performance. From where I'm sitting, that sounds like a no-brainer. <laughs> yeah, but it is clearly it, it is clearly significant.
But just as a reference point, that that at least used to be 10 nanomoles uh, per liter of testosterone was established as some limit. Potentially next month will be the two-year mark from that that case when the IAAF needs to reprove that 10 nanomoles per liter is a good number, where the normal range for women is 0.5 to 3 nanomoles per liter, and the range for men is 10 to 30. So they're basically saying that the the cutoff is the bottom end range for men. Right. That's, that is very high. Yeah. So that, that brings us to this idea for athletes like uh, Duty Chand, who is the hundred, the Indian national champion in the 100 meter, and I, I think only one of two or three women to ever represent India in the Olympics in that event. Uh, athletes like Castor Semenya, who, who Max had uh, mentioned, who's a world and Olympic champion in the 800 meters. Um, an athlete we'll talk about a bit more named Maria Martinez Patino, a hurdler from Spain, who was kind of one of the first people to have have failed a gender test and it, it become a big issue. All of those athletes different than Laurel Hubbard in that they have something called the SRY gene. And what that creates is androgen insensi- insensitivity syndrome. Uh, so to my understanding, this is a crossing over of genes on the chromosomes, which results in the athlete having hidden testes with suppressed androgen receptors. Uh, so, so what we're getting to with that is an athlete who has a vagina with internal testicles and no uterus. I feel like I'm in eighth, I'm in eighth grade health class right now. I mean, hidden testes just sounds like a game that your creepy <laughs> uncle's trying to play with you. That's a definite no, no. Continue. <laughs> yeah. So with the presence of this SR, SRY gene, you get, and, and with the suppressed androgen receptors of it, the androgen insensitivity syndrome component of this, you get athletes who were born as females who their entire life have lived as females, who it says female on their birth certificate, but they're producing a male amounts of testosterone, but because of the suppressed uh, receptors, are not able to really take advantage of that. So... It's an interesting scenario. Do you, do you, did you read or do, is there any information as to whether or not you can have the... You cannot have the SRY... Uh, gene, but also have hidden testes, in which uh, case you would receive the more benefit from the testosterone. I'm, I, obviously, you might not know that. Yeah, but that, that, that would be it, I, I guess. Across. Okay, maybe it's a, it goes hand in hand. Maybe that's the same scenario, right? To my understanding, I'd, I'd say yes. That's that's what it happened. So, with that kind of the the result, the resulting thing is you get a a very genetically advantaged female athlete. Right. You get them with much more male-esque characteristics minus, you know, the, the parts. <laughs> and <laughs> Some of the parts. One of the parts. Yeah, at least visible it. parts. And up to, we're going to talk some about gender testing, because up until the Mexico City Olympics in 1968, the gender testing process... You know, had existed in the Olympics, had existed in international sports like track and field and stuff, and that test was pull down your pants, let's see what you got. The the ocular pat down. <laughs> yes, an ocular pat down, and uh, that not surprisingly seemed to be <laughs> insensitive and and invasive to to athletes, uh, embarrassing all kinds of different things. Mm-hmm. Um, so in 1968, and this practice continued from 68 all the way through the Atlanta Olympics in 1996, they began doing these cheek swabs and testing the chromosomes within the, within the cheek swab. And, and where that became more confusing, more debatable, these gray areas, was within these uh, hyper androgynous athletes or athletes with hyperandrogenism and the SRY gene that 
they're looking at people and, and by their bone structure and their muscularity and all, all these different factors, someone like Castor Semenya, probably looking at them thinking that is a man, mm. but the the genetic testing was showing otherwise, and, and that's where right. these debates arise from. Right. So... <clears throat> Castor Semenya was subject to the swab test, right? Yes. Okay. So when when Castor Semenya is a 800 meter runner, a long distance runner for middle distance runner, I guess for South Africa, and she came along in 2009, and really no one had ever heard of her, and in the span of about six months, I want to say it took something like eight or nine seconds off of her PR in the 800, uh, a time uh, a race where women are running. Olympic level women are running right about the two minute mark, a little bit underneath that to make the finals. And at 2009 World Championships, came and ran like 156, 157, and won by two, three, four seconds. And people are like, we've never heard of this yeah, person. Yeah. Like, something's going on here. Whether it's steroid use or whether it's, it's, uh, you know, transgender issues and whatever, something's going on here, test her. And they did that. And that, there was a lot of issues about the privacy of the testing and, and uh, you know, what her rights as a athlete and person were and if that, that kind of stuff was being violated. But in, at the end, end of that process in 2010, they said, yes, she is a woman. She gets to compete as a woman. You keep your medal from the world championships, and she's gone to be very, very successful uh, Olympic champion, I believe, af- after that as well. I remember in that 2009 race and in lots of international competition in the 800 meter, uh, I have a, a friend who we're in the same recruiting class at, at Cal, and uh, a girl named Alicia Johnson, now Alicia Montano, who if, if you watch Olympic track and field, you may know her as the flying flower, runs with the big like yellow flower in her hair. I think Alicia is like seven or eight time uh, national champion in the U.S. Uh, U.S. national champion in the 800. Phenomenal athlete. And I've, I've talked about her on, on a previous episode in regards to retroactive drug testing, how she took fifth in t- the 2012 Olympics and that, that two of the athletes above her ended up failing retroactive tests and you know she lost out on four years of being bronze medalist Mm -hmm. alicia johnson instead of being fifth place alicia johnson and and the monetary gain and everything that goes along with that well i've also seen her her deal with racing against castor semenya and i remember seeing that race in 2009 uh, that alicia was in and i think got fifth at worlds thinking like this is bullshit yeah this, (laughs) this is this is a, a different playing field. But Castor Semenya has this SRY gene, androgen insensitivity. Her entire life has, has lived as a woman, says female on the birth certificate, but has internal testes, suppressed androgen receptors. But with that, a lot of the other performance benefits to a, some degree that come, that performance differences to some degree that come along with being a man, such as, um, you know, she's taller. She's like 5'10", 160. Um, generally heavier, bigger heart, bigger lungs. Right. Less body fat, denser bones, more red blood cells, narrower hips, which is a big one for sprinting performance. Um you know, relatively greater upper body strength. Um, so, so with that, Castro Semenya created a lot of a lot of controversy, a lot of discussion about about this topic. Um, the other athlete I mentioned, Duty Chand from India. She was breaking all these Indian national records, and then they came along and said. All right, we're doing gender tests, and then they said she had too much testosterone, even though in the same situation, born as a woman, lived her whole life as a woman, and yeah, you know, that's current still, I guess, kind of go, undergoing arbitration, at least the the part of how much 
testosterone should should women really have? So it all goes to to beg the question in the case of athletes with the SRY gene is how much does testosterone help? What is the difference between performing as a man and performing as a woman? Uh, there was a paper written in 1992 by uh, some physiologists at UCLA published in the Journal of Nature. The title of the paper is, Will Women Soon Outrun Men? And in this, I don't see how these guys ever came to this conclusion, but <laughs> in it, through graphing the progress of men's and women's world records across like all track and field events, they projected that women would beat men in track and field events by the year 2156. And they were saying this because the progress in women's, um, in the women's world records was much more rapid. And that was happening for a number of reasons. It was happening because uh, women hadn't been in the sport as long. Uh, there was even times up in, in like the 30s, maybe even until the 50s, where women were not allowed to do certain events. Right. They felt that, that the longer running events were too strenuous to, for women's bodies to, to do. So they just had a shorter, a shorter you know, lifespan of, of these women's events, which of course is going to yield greater improvement. And then there was this other thing that happened. It was called steroids. So it happened. Yeah. So it's the men had been using that for a longer period of time since the late fifties, where for women that was probably coming on a little bit later as women's sports became more and more competitive, that got introduced to things. Good example of, of how that's going to accelerate performance and, and concentrate performance and skew uh, this kind of t uh, experiment that these guys was d were doing in the women's shot put of the top 80 performances of all time, 75 of them happened between 1975 and 1990. And a time that, you know, sports historians such as ourselves <laughs> understand is a time it was a free for all. Yeah. You know, it was a free for all of drug use. It's like hometown so, buffet, but with D ball <laughs> and all sorts of other good stuff. From the Soviet Union, East Germany, and let's not be naive and exempt American women from this either. It was a smorgasbord <laughs> of stenazinol. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so, of course, it, it had this highly accelerated performance. And the reason that, that performance was being accelerated, I think, gets right to the heart of this issue. It's how is, it, how is the Court of Arbitration of Sport saying to the IAAF, will prove to us that testosterone helps. Well, then yeah, why the fuck is there drug testing if you guys are in I, question? I that find that helps? really interesting that they have to even state that, that they can even state that in that... The, it, ha, I guess they're trying to say prove that it actually makes a difference for women, but they already have rules in place that, that would preclude some, that would uh, prevent somebody from taking the drugs yeah. if they were just... Any any you know any female competitor taking testosterone is against it's against the rules. Now they're asking to prove that it's actually what if it, what if the case was made that it does not improve performance or yeah, they, they can happens to drug they can prove it. Then how could they ever suspend anybody for taking testosterone? Yeah, and and maybe this is a a lack of understanding on our part in in terms of or, or maybe you understand it, the answer here is a lot of about. You know, testing for testosterone is the ratio. Six to one. Four to one. Is it four to one now? I think it's four to one in weightlifting. Uh, it used, so it definitely used to be six to one for track. Yeah, you know? it may have even been higher in it the was, past. It was ten to one for cycling. Yeah. Um, which seems very odd to me that, like, oh, yeah, these cyclists, might they might just have super yeah. high testosterone. Yeah, very odd. But does it matter... Is the, is the ratio affected by the nanomoles per liter of testosterone, or is this like a total testosterone number? Because a, so, a six to one ratio could be six to one, or it could be 1,000, or 6,000 to 1,000. Yeah, so I actually, and I may be mistaken, and be correct, correct me if I'm wrong. 
I was, I believe they used to start the testing procedure first by doing a ratio test. Mm -hmm. If you failed the ratio test, then they would do an, a further test to see the absolute value of, of testosterone, of free testosterone or whatever, whatever they're testing. So if you didn't fail the ratio test, they wouldn't even do the second test. And I believe what people were doing was titrating testosterone with estrogen right up next to the meat so that the ratio test wouldn't set off a red flag. Well, and that's a lot of what like Balco and the cream, right. and the cream was about. Right. It was about keeping the, you know, raising the free testosterone compared to DHT or whatever, yeah. whatever it is. What, I don't, actually don't know what the ratio is of. I, I think it's epitestosterone. Oh, yeah. Right? Okay. So, so they were just taking both testosterone and yeah. epitestosterone. So your total value comes up, which is going to be performance enhancing, but it doesn't set off the red flag of, of a, a ratio that's off. And I believe now the current procedure is to test the total free testosterone, the total value, um, which makes more sense anyways because if you find right off the bat it's high, they're just, they're just out. Who is the uh, MMA guy, Alistair Overeem? Alistair Overeem. Yeah, like 53 to 1. I got a great story about Alistair yeah. Overeem. And he so, tried to claim that yeah. it was natural. Yeah, he tried to claim it was natural. So we were, we were in the hospital in Thailand. We went to Thailand, and we were there. And, uh, you know, my, my son hurt his foot. And so we go to the hospital. And I'm standing in the hospital in Thailand. And I'm looking, and it's like this kind of really big open atrium. And there's like these glass doors. And I see this dude, and I just recognize him. I'm like, I know this guy, I think. I'm pretty sure I know who this guy is. And he sees me, and he makes eye contact, and he, he knows, and there's a look on his face like, he knows I know who he is, but I don't know who he is yet. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at each other for a second, and then he kind of just walk, goes away, turns away, and the, five minutes later, he comes out of the room with his girlfriend, who was a very attractive young lady. And I see him, and I'm like, looking at him, and he's looking at me, like, again, the same look, and then I realize, I'll start over him. And he was just hanging out there, probably... And he's like, They're probably getting his testosterone naturally checked. Or he's like, dangerous. oh, my God, it's Rudy Nielsen. <laughs> and he said, hey, Rudy Nielsen. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit, it's Seth Rogen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he thought I was somebody else. <laughs> uh, but, but, yeah, so the, there's the ratio stuff. And I, I'm not 100% sure how this nanomoles per, per liter of testosterone is related to the ratio and, you know, the difference of testing for synthetic testosterone versus natural testosterone and, and how all that works. But it's, it, sounds, it sounds a bit fishy. And this idea that, and, and to, to read from whatever article I took this from, I can't remember, the, the Chand ruling, so this is the, the Court of Arbitration of Sport ruling in favor of sprinter, sprinter Duty Chand of India, who had been barred from competition in 2014 due to testosterone levels above established uh, limits. Chan ruling provisionally cleared the way for intersex athletes to compete without testosterone parameters. The IAAF has two years to show why the limit should be restored. Meanwhile, Castro Semenya, during the same time, running during a period of no rules uh, limitations, is unbeaten in nine 800 meter finals. <sighs> and at a meet in South Africa in the spring, she won the 400, 800, and 1500 in times. Uh, each of which would have been competitive at the world level. If Semenya was indeed suddenly freed from drugs to suppress her testosterone, the effect on her sport was even more dramatic than on her times. Um, so that, that's the other part is these hypoandrogenous athletes with the SRY gene, some of them are having to take testosterone suppressing drugs similarly to what a transgender athlete like Laurel Hubbard transitioning from male to female would, would need to do to make sure that their levels are under, or at least were having to do this to make sure their levels were under the 10 uh, nanomoles per liter. Mm -hmm. um, so to get back to the, uh, sorry, what were you gonna say? The, well, I mean, the, 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 basically you have un, unrestricted, I mean, to have no actual limit on that is just obscene. Yeah, that like, does. Like, from, it's just bizarre too. From any perspective, it's like there has to be some kind of boundary there, right? I mean, wh whether the boundary is is even <laughs> the fact that it doesn't even exist is just bizarre. I mean, why wouldn't you just have some kind of some kind of finite number that you can assign to it, it even if that's ridiculous? It's still 
particularly because if with this limit currently not existing, the idea of two years of hormone therapy post-op for to be able to compete in the IOC for someone like Laurel Hubbard, um, well, it's just so vague. Of yeah, you know, so if, if the label level is thirty, okay, she gets hormone therapy to bring it to twenty five. Right. You know, and is or nearly unaffected. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we we have this this paper projecting, you know, will women soon outrun men? That was clearly a very erroneous projection by them because, well, one, it sounded like they'd never actually watched any of these <laughs> yes. sports. Like that just ain't how it, how it works. But it in in their research, they completely negated the idea of female athletes using performance enhancing drugs, right. basically all of which are testosterone derivatives. Right. So, so this idea that the the IAAF has to prove that testosterone is is useful to females is asinine to me. Yeah. Looking at some other differences in performance from men's world records to women's world records, um, in the 100 meters, 10% difference. In the marathon, 10% difference. In the long jump, 19% difference. 50-meter freestyle uh, swimming, 13% difference. Speed skating, 1,000 meters, 9% difference. Weightlifting, uh, and this was just one weight class comparison, I I think the 69s to 69s, uh, 25% difference. So in in the sport there, that's probably most pertinent to to what we're talking about, a 25% advantage for men's lifters compared to women's lifters. Yes, that is... You know, the, the biggest contributing factor to that is probably testosterone, but also significant uh, contributing factors are going to be the things we mentioned before. Uh, less body fat, denser bones, uh, you know, hip structure, the natural upper body strength, uh, and the, the study, and I'll, I'll try and post in the, in the comments of this stuff, like these different articles that I was getting these from, but uh, upper body strength, Differences was three standard deviations of men, you know, any man off the street compared to any woman off the street, upper body strength comparison, meaning 997 out of 1,000 men were likely to have greater upper body strength than the female. So some of those are, are related to Testosterone, but some of them are, are related to, to bone structure and all that kind of stuff. Things that don't change with hormone therapy. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, I guess you could look at it and say, is, I mean, you know, assuming you had a female who was taking testosterone for 25 years, then cessation of testosterone for two years, I mean, the effect has to be, I mean, the, the there's got to be some significant performance benefit to doing that because, yeah. I mean, 25 years of, of augmentation followed by a small time of not, just as you would if you were a male for 25 years, then you're not, and the, you're competing against people that had nowhere close to that level of testosterone in their body ever. Yeah, so a couple other notes before we kind of get into the bigger discussion of all this just to frame what we're talking about in regards to performance differences between men and women. Um, we have an athlete named Joanna Harper. Um, and, and if you haven't read the book uh, or listened to the audiobook version of it, in my case, uh, The Sports Gene, um, whose the, the author's name is escaping me for a second here, but uh, the David Epstein, uh, The Sports Gene by David Epstein, he has a, a chapter in there called Why Men Have Nipples, and it talks about a lot of these genetic differences. And in it, he talks about an athlete named Joanna Harper, who is Masters National Champion in cross country uh, in 2009. And Joanna Harper had transitioned from male to female in 2004. So 2004 is our line of, of demarcation. In 2005, she ran about 50 seconds slower per mile than she had in 2003. Um, so that, that's a significant difference. That's a big difference, having gone through the, the hormone therapy, you know, gender reassignment surgery, and, and hormone therapy, 
to lose 50 seconds per mile in a run. But uh, as far as sex and age graded performance showed about the same level of competitiveness for right. either one. So in that sport, cross country maybe is, is you know, it's going to be probably different based on these different sports, more explosive sports to more endurance based sports. Laurel Hubbard, master grandmaster from Masters World Games recently in New Zealand, snatched six kilos more competing as a woman than she ever did competing as a man. And now these are N1 examples. You know, this is not formalized study. There's time and training that went on there. She could have been doing shit, you know, program as a man and a great one as a woman. But all things considered, they're six kilos more. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's really, that's actually a very intriguing scenario in that you would assume if the, if the, if Harper is running 50 seconds less, where running would seem like it'd be even less affected than weightlifting, Mm -hmm. it's pure power based sport, but still improving. I mean, from, from a lot of perspectives, it's just very interesting. I mean, that, that's, impressive that there's progress still again you know training program can have a huge a huge impact on that uh you know and all all host of psychological factors too if you just feel more comfortable as a person you might do better in training and you know yada 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 um but yeah very interesting so what what all of this kind of come comes down to is a discussion of of fairness, of, of what is fair, and uh, you know how sh- how should these athletes be treated? Where should they compete? Who should they compete against? And I think it's too clear. Or it it has to be differentiated between Laurel Hubbard lived as a man, transitioned to compete as a as a female, versus Castor Semenya. Born as a woman, lived as a as a woman, with this condition that was and until someone does a gender test on you, you probably have no idea. Yeah, yeah. About those testes were hidden the whole time. Yeah. So to me, to set the 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 marker at two years of hormone therapy, particularly with this lack of of uh, clear line of this much testosterone is allowed. Two years, I don't think, could possibly be significant yeah. enough. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the number is, but yeah, more I mean, than two years is what I think it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, to, to the bigger to the bigger picture too. The bigger sort of discussion is, I mean, the rules are the rules. So, so the issue is never with none of the issues are ever with the competitors because they're simply playing by the rules as they see them, as, as the rules exist. So all of these scenarios, anything we're saying in terms of making things more fair, et cetera, et cetera, is always a matter of, of pointing, pointing out where the rules and the actual decisions to say, hey, this is the limit, that's the time frame, et cetera, et cetera. That stuff's all based within the rules of the sport. Um, it's certainly an interesting, it's an interesting scenario in that you, no one's really said, no one's really created a position or created any kind of situation to say, hey, like we can say that two years or six months or 18 months is the right time frame because of this. It, it almost appears to be just completely arbitrary. Yes. Just, just pick a number out of your, your ass and there you go. It's. One one more real important important stat uh, that I, I forgot to bring up and that will be useful here is during this time of doing the cheek swabs as the gender identification test for the Olympics from 1968 to 1996, they found on average one in 420 women, um, specifically at the 96 Olympics, it was one out of 480, but over the whole time span, almost 30 years, which is a significant, uh, you know, body of evidence there. Uh, one in 480 women competing in the Olympics across all sports 
had the SROI gene, androgen insensitivity. A typical rate of that in the female population is somewhere between 1 in 20,000 and 1 in 64,000. So 500 to, to 1,500 times more, more likely. Yeah. To, to exist in a, in a female Olympian than in the, in the general population. So that's good talent identification. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that kind of is, seems like it is the thing with the SRY gene is with that, you're really just getting a female who has great genetics for their sport, which is a big, big difference than getting a male who transitions to to a female. Right. Right. So to to me there has to be some kind of some kind of distinction drawn here. One that there should definitely be a testosterone limit. Right. The, the fact that there's any debate about what about is testosterone helpful to female athletes is ridiculous. Of course of course right. it's helpful. If they decide that it's not helpful, then everyone just start taking it. Yeah, it gets as much ridiculous. as they want. Like then they would I, I don't see how they could argue to not let female athletes who are not transgender or do not have SR yeah. Y gene, how they could stop them from taking testosterone yeah. up to that limit. Like that yeah. that's ridiculous. You could almost even say, here's here's the data we've collected of all the of all the data we can find on testosterone levels in blood for female competitors, female people. And you're you know, from that pool of data you say okay the average level on the high side on the low side this is the average right it's 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 not you know 400 uh nanograms per deciliter it's like 10 right so that could be the start of that discussion as to where the limit is right it's it's based off of evidence we have for people not just you know i mean a, a ratio of six to one or eight to one is just superhuman. I mean, that's <laughs> it's so and, rare. It's usually closer to one to one, two to one, and I'm sure there's cases where it can be very high, but but you're taking there's obviously a leniency towards towards this being very open ended, and if you created something that was much tighter, where there's an absolute limit that's very close to physiological levels, you have a much better scenario for testing. Well, do we know? So, so this is this data to me is showing the one in four hundred eighty women, and and just generally, uh, one of the other things they talk about in sports gene was from the from this testing of Olympic athletes and stuff that they were they were generally on the high side of testosterone. Sure. Anyways, yeah. they were talking about females. Do you know or do you think that that's the same thing is true? For males, that male Olympic athletes are generally Probably, yeah. higher testosterone levels. I would have to believe so. I mean, yeah, there's, yeah. I mean, I would have to believe, yeah, that that the the you know the higher testosterone males are going to be driven and, and selected to be in those sports, right? I mean, yeah. or in sports. So if if naturally higher testosterone males are being allowed to compete, and the, and there's whatever limit on that testosterone being placed, but they're they tend towards the higher side of things. Then women, who, women, and when I'm saying that, I, I mean born as a woman, lived as their whole life as a woman, tend towards the higher side of the testosterone as well. That, to me, makes perfect sense. Right. Yeah. What does not is to have a, a woman transitioning or a man transitioning yeah. into woman, yeah. and 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 to not just have the benefits of higher testosterone. With the other physical attributes, height, heart size, lung size, bone density, red blood cell count, uh, hip structure being relatively the same. But now to take all of those advantages and yeah. and only diminish the this one advantage, not right. eliminate this one advantage, yeah, but diminish, diminish it, yeah. it to, to a point that it's still... Three to twenty times higher than the, than the normal range for women. To me, seem, seems like these governing bodies in sport are doing female athletes a disservice. Yeah. Well, that's that's the interesting case, right? It's it's 
I think there's, I think, and I, I, you know, I would say especially in like the the transition, the people that are transitioning from from male to female, because I don't believe there's there are women transitioning to men that yes. are succeeding in sport at a high level against men. Um, yeah, that, that were men from birth or, or you know that didn't transition. That to me is is the simplest argument right. about the fairness of of gender identity, transgender athletes in sport. Yeah. It, yeah. All of it is man transitioning to woman and winning and, and beating everyone and setting, setting all these new records. When some, and, and maybe someone has an example of this and they can post it in the comments. When there is one, and we really need more than one, but when there is a <laughs> example of yeah. female transitioning to male and being a champion, an international champion in that sport, then I think we can begin to, to yeah. discuss, oh, okay, well, it doesn't matter if you're a man right, or a woman. Yeah. It's, all about the, it's all about the hormones, right? Yeah, it's all about the, the hormone therapy. Yeah, yeah. When, when Jera Lee Vega, you know, this is well known, so it's not like we're talking yeah. about a secret. If Jera Lee Vega was the American record holder, is the American record holder, in the snatch, clean, jerk, and total in the 63 kilo it's class. Just the, the clean, jerk, and total. Oh, okay. Wolfolk has the snatch. Oh, clean, jerk, and total. And now has transitioned. And I don't know at what stage of the transition. Definitely Jacked. the hormone therapy Jacked part. I, I can't <laughs> speak to the, to the surgery part of things. But if she comes along or he comes along and starts competing as a, as a male and sets the American record in the clean and jerk in the total. Yeah. <laughs> then sure. Then we can have yeah. a, a discussion that it's that, all copacetic. That yeah. Point. That's it's all about the hormones and yeah. you just do the hormone therapy and it's all it's all fine. Yeah. Because what is being done now is in an effort of political correctness or sensitivity, oversensitivity, whatever it is, that they're being in an effort to be fair to an incredibly small. A minority of female athletes, they are being unfair, or potentially you know, creating a environment that can be unfair to the overwhelming majority yeah. of the female athletes. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's also there's you know there's so many really interesting cultural aspects and social aspects to it too. I mean, this only really affects female competitors. Yeah. In that, the male competitors, fifty percent of the field. You know, um, it's very interesting. I mean, there's a lot to be said for, for, you know, uh, what are the, what are the ramifications of it? I, I, I honestly don't believe there's going to be hordes of, of men changing gender yeah. to compete in women. I don't think that's the case. So, you know, assuming that's not the case, uh, does it does it lend itself to say it would perhaps be more fair to everybody if there were other there was another category for people that have changed gender from from one or the other right female to male and male to female uh, to compete against people that have the most similar situation to you would be the most fair um, I mean the irony is that in masters com competitions, you don't compete against people of the same, of different age groups initially. You compete against everybody in the same age group first. So they're even distinguishing based on age, there needs to be more categories. If they can make the assumption there needs to be distinguished categories for different ages, well, five years, wouldn't the same be said for <laughs> having, you know, a certain amount of time as a different uh, gender? to be switched to another and that, I mean, that's, the, that's where I feel like it's kind of an interesting, there's so many categories yet there isn't a category here. And it, maybe it is just a matter of, of sport recognizing these people and saying, hey, you, you deserve to have your own level playing field amongst people that are in the same situation as you um, and be recognized as, as excellent athletes in that position rather than being put into categories that are not necessarily fair to, to you know, everybody involved in it, right? You know, I, I don't remember if I was reading Facebook comments or saw an interview about this with uh, Janae Marie Krosieleski, mm. formerly Matt 
Matt Krosielski talking about having gone on, on hormone therapy and that kind of stuff and how his strength levels were affected and, and kind of saying like, you know, I, I ended up doing about the numbers that these top, top female powerlifters are doing. Yeah. That, that was, you know, 650 squat, 400 bench, or 600 squat, 400 bench, 650 deadlift, something, something around there. Sure. And powerlifting, untested powerlifting becomes yeah, such a, a further <laughs> clouded issue because, you know, hormone therapy is, is not the right term going on. It's a lot <laughs> but, of self-medication. <laughs> yeah, a lot of self-medication in, in untested female powerlifting that kind of clouds the issue more. But he was saying, you know, he went from being this, this top men's lifter to lifting the numbers, you know, not in competition, uh, but lifting the numbers the same as, as the top female lifter. So is that evidence that, well, it's, it's the same, like, and, uh, and it's only a one, one person example, but yeah, I feel like that's gotta be a stretch because, because I mean, he's, he, he may be, let's say those numbers were the same that you're talking about somebody who, who's, who's coming down to that from a super physiological level as a male, mm -hmm. um, you know, and who was an, a very, very strong male, top, you know, 0.1%, um, to now be literally, would be literally the strongest female. Yeah. Right? I think that's almost more of like, you know, if he came down and became, you know, top 10% of elite female lifters, maybe that would be a little more kind of buy into like the idea that okay maybe they are more equal because there's got to be women that are very very predisposed and talented to it and taking drugs yeah yeah i mean i don't know well it's it's like you said the the example you said before if if you have a female athlete you know so, so we have a, a male athlete transitioning to female at age 25 so t for 25 years lived as a male regular testosterone levels you know, everything that comes along with that. And then at age 27, has now passed the IOC standard of two years of hormone therapy post-op to compete as a female. People are much more inclined to say that that is okay, I think. Yeah. Rather than have a female, and, and this is going to be off because, you know, no one is taking steroids as a baby, but for the, <laughs> for the sake of this, 25 years of performance-enhancing drug use and then cutting that out at age 25 to then compete at age 27 yeah. in a situation that they can pass the drug test, let's say, and I know different things, you know, you're supposed to have been clean for two years or three years or seven years and you sign your name and whatever and say that you have been, if you pass the test, you pass the test. Yeah. So let's say 25 years of drug use, stop for two years and compete. Almost no one is going to be like, oh, that's, that's fair. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, you know, they could theoretically just say, I mean, sport is not about being, sport isn't necessarily about being all inclusive. Sport is about qualifying for the standards to compete. And we're talking about the Olympics and these top level sports. You could almost say that any manipulation of hormones is against the rules. Up, down, whatever, side, uh, to side. side to side, any kind of change of hormones for a medical reason or anything is not allowed. And, and you're going to isolate, you're going to obviously eliminate a lot of people, people that have medical conditions, all of those things. But, you know, uh, I mean, there, there's obviously like temporary use exemption forms which come into play that broad, you know, bring up another big issue when the entire water polo team has asthma and they all have clenbuterol <laughs> prescriptions and, you know, you have a prescription for Adderall, the super, super strong, uh, you know, stimulants. Like, there's so much gray area around all of this just in the world of sports being, you know, generally on the shadier side yeah. and, and all of that. But, you know, it's very interesting. I... I I will say that it's a confusing scenario. It's difficult to explain how it makes sense or how it is, how it fits into the realm of being fair 
when you have to make it as, have to explain it as simply as you can to someone who's maybe you know ten years old. How, how do you explain the idea that it's well some, to, you know, to that exact situation? I mean, that is yeah. a scenario that happened in New Zealand for you guys. Yes, it did. Yeah, your son Asher, ten yeah. years old, there yeah. with you. He sees his mom Joanne yeah. lift, lift great, <laughs> make these PRs, yeah. and then not win. Yeah, yeah. Grandmaster, what what, what uh, was that I conversation? Know, what was, I mean, what was Joe's reaction to it? Even I mean, I think Joe was. I think everyone was just kind of confused. And well, Joanne's about as progressive a uh, baby. Yeah, we live, we live in San Francisco. <laughs> Joanne has no. Yeah. There's there's no there's no issues with with the, the situation. We're just confused. I think the confusion from a lot of people. I think there was more a matter of, of, for one is, let's say you're in that situation. You're in, you know, uh, Laurel Hubbard. Laurel, I was, Miss Hubbard, I, I'm not sure. You're in, <laughs> you're in Hubbard's cupboard here. And <laughs> you're, you're having to say, okay, I'm gonna compete because I'm allowed to compete, which is fair. You win. What is, what is the motive? You know, I mean, I, I suppose if you believe that it's fair and it's right and you're within the rules, it's it's fine. When you have to step back and say it's very easy to eat, like put up an argument saying clearly this is not as fair as it may seem on the surface. Well, I would be interested to ask Laurel Hubbard, who was competing as a master's, you know, how old, yeah. old she was. 30, 35, I think, 36. Right. So let's say Laurel Hubbard's 36. Laurel Hubbard, what do you think about a female athlete taking steroids right. up until age 34, having taken them for as long of period of time as conceivable, and then stopping for two years and passing the test and competing against you as a woman? Yeah. Is that yeah. fair to, yeah, to I mean, her? I would be shocked. If, yeah, that's what I think if, is most interesting. Yeah. Right? Well, or, or let's say... You you qualify for the Olympics, go to the Olympics, and you get just murdered by, you know, a Russian woman who has a doping violation at 14 years old <laughs> by 50 kilos in the total. I mean, how do you feel about that? I mean, it's a very like oh, I I, I got beat fair and square because they're within the they're within the written rules the, by the rules as they are stated, not the spirit of the rules here. Um, I know the the <laughs> really the, odd. The number two seed in Marissa's weight class for IPF Worlds upcoming, uh, Olga Golubeva, a Russian lifter, has served a doping suspension. Probably tainted meat or something. <laughs> Probably, Probably the target, those Moscow targets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's got a it's got a backwards R in the title. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that's that's again, you know, I mean I, I think we're everyone was very confused. You know, I would say it's it's more confusion as to. What's happening here? What are we watching? How does this work? I don't think, you know, there's obviously people that say, oh, it's wrong, it's wrong. I don't necessarily agree that it's wrong. I think it's just there's a confusion as to, I think this is probably something within the realm of sports that is very poorly, uh, the rules are very poorly laid out. They're very kind of uh, almost like off the cuff, like they had to figure it out on the spot and they sort of just went with this. I mean, it used to be, you know, that whatever society and culture were it was easy to just say pull your pants down and we'll do that and they kind of just you know maybe turned the, the blind eye to what was going on or they you know they didn't acknowledge people for where you know where they believe they they should be acknowledged but now it's it's a situation where you know this has happened this these situations in which there are speculation as to you know gender uh testing scenarios you have the 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 people that have genetic predispositions to different things you have people that are transitioning there needs to be a better uh a better understood and established method for uh you know the rules by which they compete where they compete how that's fair for all athletes yeah now i know like crossfit there was issues few years ago with an athlete that was trying to compete in CrossFit and was flat out just denied. Yes. In which CrossFit is a private business, so they can kind of do whatever they want. But their logic was very straightforward, as I believe, was just, well, you had the advantages of being a male for so long, and you changed, and so that's not fair. And, and in that instance, at least the transition had happened... Really long time. Yeah, 15 years yeah. before the... the yeah. 
the CrossFit issue came about. Yeah. But yeah, to to me it it and I know I know the the question of what is gender, what is someone's gender in the last 5 years, 10 years, whatever has become a much much more complex yeah. answer than we well, got mankini. <laughs> than when your mom gave birth to you and the doctor said congrats. Yeah. You have, you know, a new baby boy. Congrats, you have a new baby girl. The the question the, the answer to that has become much much more complex. Right. I don't know that the complexity and feelings and nuance of all of those answers should enter into what sport or what division that the people are, are supposed to be competing in. To me, that's a much more simple line to draw of you are going to compete as the, as the gender that you were born. Right. Where it's a more gray area when you get into this androgen and sensitivity syndrome, SRY gene, hyper androgenism of people who have, when they were born, they said, this is a girl, but have the internal testes and, and high testosterone level that comes along with that. That's a much more complex right. thing. Yeah. Clearly there should be a limit on testosterone that female competitors can have implemented. Yeah, that is no doubt. brainer. But, you know, for, for my opinion, competing as, as the gender that someone was born, there are nuances to that answer now that are beyond my understanding, and that's for someone else to answer. But, you know, it's funny. If you think about, let's say the rules are just the rules. They're exactly the way they are. You're going to get drug tested randomly out of competition. 15 years ago, Laurel Hubbard would have failed at least two drug tests for having too high a testosterone level. So there's a scenario where you would have already been banned and ineligible to compete anyways because in a, like the same scenario, yes, that's a good you're point. a female at 14 years old, Kasharina Tatiana fails drug test. She has a drug test on her name at 14. You know, like... You you circumvented the the you know <laughs> you circumvented the rules by being a different gender then, and now it benefits you when you transition, right? I think, yeah, I, I, it's a very it's a very odd place. I mean, because then, I mean, there's no way you'd pass a drug test. Yeah. I mean, you have a testosterone level that's you know ten times what a woman was yeah. at the time. That's a very good point. Very odd. Yeah, I, I think that that's one of the, one of the easiest analogies or whatever to use is this is extended time of drug use versus extended time of being a man and then a two year transitional period of off drugs uh hormone or hormone therapy one of them people are are much more inclined to protect much more inclined to say that this this is okay and, and i get that there's there's emotion and sympathy and empathy and and you know, these incredibly high rates of, of suicide within transgender people and, and all this stuff. And that's why people, I think, are wanting to to say, yeah, this is okay. Because no one, no one's saying yeah, yeah. this woman who's been doing, who's been doing steroids, who would have been caught 10 times over, <laughs> oh, she can, she can compete now because she was clean for two years. Yeah. Yeah, it's because really, there's no there's no feelings and, and empathy about yeah, that. It's purely, it's purely would have been a violation of the rules back then. What's interesting too is I think I'm not sure how how uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm sure people will. But there, I believe in certain sports, maybe certain countries, there's what's called a, a doping passport, and and this is a passport that you essentially have that's stamped and they keep records of testing when it's done and they do blood testing where they'll keep track of red blood cell count, testosterone levels and these things. And they enter, they keep track of this data throughout the course of the athlete's career. This may be a German thing where they, they keep track of these, these things. And if they see like, okay, it's usually for red blood cell, like EPO and stuff where, oh, hey, you know, we have a baseline mm -hmm. for five years here now suddenly your red blood cell count is twice as high, what's going on? Because you have to have, you, you can't compare, you don't know exactly where that is, right? Yeah. But if you have somebody who would, have, who would, again, the same situation, 
had a doping passport, had five years of, you know, extremely high testosterone levels for a female, then all of a sudden they drop and now you're a female and you're competing, you know, I mean, <laughs> there's the statistical analysis that's not going to, you know, it's going to show that you're, you would have been guilty of doping violation then. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, at end of the day, it's a, it's a, it's a big question. It's a tough question. It's one that neither Max or I have the answer to, but certainly we have our opinions about it. Um, you know, it, it hit close to home, yeah. uh, the situation with, with Joe and, and competing against Laurel Hubbard in, in New Zealand. And it's a conversation that needs to be had because in my opinion, these governing bodies of sport in an effort to be fair to the minority are being unfair to the majority of, of their competitors. Um, it's, it's going to be something that, that over the next several years, I'm sure is going to hit close to home again, you know, whether if sure. it's, it's Ada V Hubbard, you know, <laughs> round two, or it starts coming in to affect USAW IPF powerlifting, you know, this, different stuff it's it's gonna it's gonna be be something we have to deal with and it's gonna be something that that there had to be questions about sure so you know hopefully we we brought up some good points like i said i tried to do a, a good little bit of research on on this and and have some useful numbers and useful case studies and stuff to bring to the table with this uh we're interested to hear your feedback so please you know if we mess things up if we said the wrong term if we got some of the rules wrong let us know yeah. in the comments please try and keep the discussion you know respectful and and yeah just re respectful because it is something that that's very sensitive to people but uh a conversation that that needs to be had so with that i think we kind of end that discussion max where can they find you uh you can find me on instagram and facebook uh, max underscore Ada, or you can email me max JTS strength for any questions about online coaching or the juggernaut, uh, team. And I'm Chad Wesley Smith at Chad Wesley Smith and at juggernaut training on Facebook and Instagram, filling up your news feed all day. Make sure to subscribe to the juggernaut YouTube channel with the best fitness videos on all of YouTube. And if you enjoyed the podcast, uh, please go on iTunes, leave us a five-star review, write us something funny. And we always appreciate seeing those. Till the next time.